We're about to discuss again Orinoco, a major novel by Afra Bain, and one which made, in fact, instigated a body of anti-slavery literature during the 18th century. There's no question that Afra Bain's identification of Africans as being human beings, as being people with emotions, sentiments, concerns, family life, reoriented people who looked upon slaves as cargo. And there's no question that this novel was used throughout the century as an example of the types of treatment human beings should receive. We do know that in the Constitution of the United States, blacks still were not given full rights, were not given, uh, yeah, slaves were not given any rights, but there was a body of recognition of their presence, and although it took a great deal of time, eventually they received their emancipation. And we have to acknowledge that this document played some role in offering people a stabilizing pattern of human beings of color. As we begin to discuss Orinoco today, we're going to look at it through five, in five categories, uh, six categories. First, we're going to look at aspects of it through government what it tells us about religion, what we know about the economics of the time, what it addresses in terms of art and aesthetics, what we learn about science and technology, what we discover about the nature of one's education, and finally, we examine social behavior. You can recognize these topics through the anagram Greases, G-R-E-A-S-E-S. -E -E and when you're asked to write papers, examinations in this class, you'll be asked to isolate one of these Greases for a major, pa a major section of your exam and to write on the way in which the author helps us understand society uh, and some aspect of society. Now, it's too large a task in any single paper. It's too large a task to try to cover everything from government to social behavior, from religion to science. And so you always must focus. Also in this class, whenever you write papers, I'm not interested in having you write about a whole book. I'm not interested in having you write about a whole poem. What you do in Orinoco is select 25 or 30 pages and deal with that swath of literature. And tell me which pages you're focusing on. In that way, you limit your focus, you isolate important items, you restrict the number of details you must provide, and you offer a paper that's greater in depth than in breadth. And I'm always looking for a paper in depth. The second purpose of writing in this class, of course, is to help identify the meaning, the significance, and the importance of the text you're dealing with. And this requires first identifying what the motifs of the writer are. What specific ideas does the writer want to express? That's very, very important. Once you've identified what the writer wishes to express, then you really want to examine one other feature which is important to literature and to language. How does the author do it? How does the author attract your attention? How does the author keep your focus? How does the author entertain momentum? How does the author use facts in one place and then remind you about them later in order to unify ideas? What types of trope does a, an author use? What kinds of similes? What kinds of metaphors? What kinds of rhetorical effects does the author use? How does he balance his sentences? 
because how an author says something is as important as what he says. We're not only interested in just the topics, we're interested in the way the author moves toward the subject. And the last items in anything you write for this class, uh, the last item asks you to try to find some modern analog, something in your experience or something you've read that makes this particular portion you've extracted meaningful. You may not know that slavery exists in this world today, but when you pick up studied analyses, you pick up some fine magazines, you pick up some exploratory newspapers, and you discover that a woman has escaped from slavery in some Middle Eastern country, or you've discovered even in this country that people are held in oppression and they're confined by people who hold them in thrall. Uh, that there are problems existing in our society that in fact mirror and in fact help us explicate the events earlier. Because human behavior, unfortunately, in many instances, doesn't change. And uh, people of power try to suppress people without power. This, of course, is true in Orinoco. Well, let's first of all look at the aspects of government in Orinoco. Uh, we know that the novel begins as two governments, or three governments involved. First of all, we have the government of... Afrobane's existence, England. And in fact, she writes in the beginning of her novel that she has acquired a great deal of materials from Suriname, and she returns them to England so that people can see the kinds of life she has experienced and the kinds of riches she has brought back with her. The second country is uh, Suriname, which in this novel is under the uh, protection of England, if you want to use the word protection, or under the rule of England. A very shortly after, because of the Dutch wars, it passes to Holland. <coughs> now, the government we're looking at is basically Coromantian in the Gold Coast. It's apparently a sophisticated government, a government of some quality. And when you turn to page uh, 423 in your text, you see that there is, in fact, a king who is considered a war captain. So now we know that the, tea, that the king is a tribal king and that the king finds himself at war with neighboring tribes. This is a, uh, consistent with the history of Africa. By the way, it's also consistent with the history of Ireland. Those who try to study Ireland as a monolithic state before the 17th century are going to be confused because Ireland is really a series of tribes and tribal units that ultimately become unified, forced into unity uh, by the English, ultimately into defeat by William at the Battle of Boyne, and finally as a member of the Commonwealth in 18, 1801, when it was finally admitted to the United Kingdom. We find that <clears throat> the war captain is a man who leads them in battle and success. And Afrobane says, I shall have occasion to discuss this soon after. And so her ability to start you with an idea and then suspend it for later information is a way of holding and attracting the reader. She tells us that Coromantian is a country of blacks, so-called, and it was one of those places in which they found the most advantageous trading for slaves. We'll get into that in a few moments when we get into the field of economics. We find out that the king, we're on page 424 of your text, the king of Coromantian was of himself a man of a hundred years old, a hundred and odd years old, and had no son, though he had many beautiful black wives. And then we get into a certain aesthetic point, for most certainly there are beauties 
that can charm of that color. Now, why did he gain strength? How did he gain strength? This becomes a militaristic history of the government. In his younger years, he had many gallant men to his sons, 13 of which died in battle. 13 sons conquering when they fell. They never fell in defeat. This is his attitude and because he is ruling the country and because the country has stabilized itself amongst other tribes, it has, he has been successful. His sons have died heroically. This is the basic theme here. When they fell and he had only left him for his successor one grandchild, son to one of these dead victors, who as soon as he could bear a bow in his hand and a quiver in his back, was sent into the field to be trained by one of the older, oldest generals. Now here again we have our first introduction to Orinoco, the grandson, the heir. Now Aphrobane was aware that Charles I's son James was going to have a son, a grandson. And if you were a royalist, and if you were of the Duke of York's party, this was something to celebrate. Because the hegemony continued. Were you unhappy with James's religion, and fearful that his son would perpetuate the religion, then you wanted to remove him from the throne. And that, of course, is what happened. But the idea of a father having a grandson who can succeed him is a very, very important recognition in a divine right king, certainly in the leadership of, of, Af of this African nation. He had scarce arrived at his 17th year, this Orinoco, when fighting by his side, the general was killed with an arrow in his eye, which the prince Orinoco very narrowly avoided. Notice the detail. An arrow in his eye. What precise shooting. What a gory detail. But people were accustomed to gory details after the Jacobean plays, the plays of Thomas Kidd. This was one of the items that would make this seem realistic. Nor had he if the general who saw the arrow shot, and perceiving it aimed at the prince, had not bowed his head between on purpose to receive it in his own body, rather than it should touch that of the prince, and so saved him. Now we get heroic action. The arrow was actually headed for Orinoco. The general, because he was but a general and not heir to the throne, sought to protect Aronoko, ran into, in front of him, and the arrow pierced his eye. This dramatic action, this tension of loyalty, this recognition of the need to sustain the royal lineage, and of course Aronoko was the last of the royal lineage, suggests loyalty, a sense of power, a sense of pride, a sense of skill, what we're dealing with here is a sophisticated supervision of governance. Now you have to understand, Aphrobane wrote this in the 17th century. A hundred years later, a fellow by the name of Adam Smith wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations. And in The Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith says there are four priorities of a nation. The first priority is defense. If you cannot defend your country, you have no country. Today, 250 years later, our defense budget is still the largest expense of the nation. Whether we're at war or whether we're not at war, it's always the largest expense of the nation. Because among other circumstances, you must protect your trading vessels so that no one can rob them, steal them, hijack them, or prevent you from trading across the oceans. Adam Smith says the second priority of a nation is a justice system. You've got to have fair judges. The third priority of a nation says Adam Smith is civil works. 
You've got to make sure that the potholes are, are covered. You've got to make sure that the lights are working. You've got to make sure that the people can go to work comfortably. And the fourth priority of a nation is education. Not the least important, but the last of the four priorities. So education always gets less money than defense. And what we're finding here is that defense is the first priority of Coromantian and the king. And so as you begin studying this novel, and we move on into it, you find out that there is obedience to a war captain. Now, the king is the ruler. And the king and Arunelko is in love. The 17 year old is in love. Now that's not unusual. The Hebrew scriptures tell us that you should marry between the ages of 13 and 18. So Arunelko, according to a, uh, physical attributes, certainly was eligible and he fell in love with a native by the name of Imoenda. But Imoenda also was noticed by the king of Coromantian at a hundred plus years who wanted him for him, who wanted her for himself. And as I pointed out the other day, the king rules. What he wants, he gets. And that's even true in Africa today amongst large tribal units. The king's command is the will of the people and becomes the will of the people. The king then robs his grandson of a treasure and the issue is, what is Orinoco's reaction? Orinoco at first then refuses to serve in his role as general of the armies. So he's going to subvert the cause of defense. And the army needs leadership. <clears throat> Eventually, Aranoko feels that he has an obligation to his people and to his soldiers more than he has an obligation to his love and consequently he agrees to return to lead the uh, Coromantian army. We're going to get the, the circumstances by which Aranoko finally consummates his love with Imoenda we're going to discuss under social behavior we're not going to come under the government but when the king of Coromantian at 100 years plus discovers he can no longer have Imuenda because she has consummated her love before his with Orinoco in the Otan when he discovers this his enmity with Orinoco is understood and he is determined to get rid of this displacement and replacement. And consequently when Orinoco <clears throat> goes on one of the slave ships to inspect the cargo he's part of it. The king is part of it. The African leaders are part of it. They collect the cargo. They chain these people. They hold them in the forts for the Royal African Company they put him on the boats to go overseas and Orinoco goes on a slave ship knowing that his slaves are there to talk with the captain and at that point he himself is enchained now what you have is his disenfranchisement as a leader as a political ruler and as an heir to the throne. I should have brought the clipping in from the Chronicle this morning. The Houston Chronicle had an article where in the uh, uh, area of Serbia and former Yugoslavia, there are large groups of people who've had their identity cards taken from them. They can't apply for hospital benefits. They can't apply for jobs. They can't apply for benefits. They can't apply for education because they are non-existent. And the courts are now trying to rule of how they're supposed to get back their identity. I'm sorry I don't have the details. I should have cut out, cut out the article for you. But it was in this newspaper 
uh, this morning. And uh, here we have a case of a prince, a royal prince, deprived of his power, deprived of his legacy. Orinoco is then taken to Suriname, where he is now under the rule of the English, and he's given a new name, Caesar. Now, anyone who gets the name Caesar should be proud of that name, because Caesar acknowledges the leadership of the Roman world. Caesar is the emperor. But obviously, the name Caesar is given to Orinoco as an ironic mockery. Call him Caesar and make him a slave. The, tomb, the terms are anomalous. They don't exist together. And consequently, he is humiliated doubly, first by being a slave, secondly, by being named Caesar, an appellation which obviously does not obtain in this particular category. However, we do know that he has gained respect on the plantation. Why? Because he is of regal bearing. We know that on the slave ship, he had gained power because the slaves wouldn't move. They wouldn't eat. They threatened to fast and die if chains were not removed from the Prince Orinoco. On the plantation, Orinoco is recognized by the slaves as the Prince of Coromantian. <clears throat> we realize in this novel that there's going to be a government treaty. The Dutch are going to acquire Suriname. And the Dutch are pretty brutal in their conquest of the Indians of the island. We see these transitions occurring. Orinoco gives us leadership tests among the Indians. And discovery of others who exist. This is not a monolithic this is not a monolithic society. There are tribes even in Suriname. There are different types of Indian populations. There are different types of populations, each of which must be dealt with separately because they have separate leaders. So the government is not a, uh, a monolithic state, just as the United States is a republic and constitutes many, many different states uh, offering different opinions and different attitudes by diverse leaders. <clears throat> when Orinoco attempts to protest the institution of slavery, we have a Ciceronian speech. Aphrobane has literally taken her classical education and <clears throat> turned this into Orinoco's powerful speech uh, against slavery, urging others to join him. Tuscan, the only one who stays with him, however, says that he worries that their families may suffer. You find <coughs> arguments between the Paramites and the anti-Paramites, those who support the, uh, uh, the British and those who don't. The battle, and finally, Orinoco's conquest. People promise him that they are going to treat him kindly and they will negotiate a peace treaty with him. Instead, they whip him brutally and shame him before the other uh, uh, slaves. It's the decision of the council to punish Orinoco as an example. And uh, let's just get this right. Finally, of course, we have Orinoco's revenge and insurrection, where he seeks now to sacrifice Imoenda. He will not have her live in slavery, he will not have himself with a child in slavery. So he murders 
Emoenda and his child. He himself suffers enervation because he is so saddened by what he has done that he cannot gain the strength to seek revenge against the rulers. He himself is captured and then put to death. But he's put to death in a horrible way. His body parts are first cut off. He is mutilated. And then once he a spear is thrust in his eye, once he is dead, his body is quartered uh, as a sign of what will happen to those who are treasonous. Just as the regicides, those who had executed Charles I, were executed by Charles II, and their body parts put on the various gates of London to rot away. People were forbidden to take those body parts away until all you had was bone left to show the people what would happen in case of treason. So the novel gives us a sense of government that is in one ways rational, enterprising, economic, another government that is oppressive and uh, suppressive. And I think throughout the novel we have sympathy granted to Orinoco and to Orinoco's uh, family. Now let's, uh, let me just ask you, is there anyone here who would like to add anything to your information about government? Is there any aspect of the novel that you would like to stress or emphasize in some way? If not, consider government is a possible topic for a critical paper and ask yourself whether the governments of the world that you recognize or the governments that you follow uh, operate equitably or whether democracy demonstrates the differences between an oligarchic government and a government of free people. Let's move on to the next subject now, which is the subject of religion. Afrobane now begins to discuss who these people are and what their religious interests are. Among her statements, they wear just before them, as Adam and Eve did, fig leaves. Now that's very important uh, because Afrobane is writing this without realizing that a uh, John Milton had told us that Eve ate of the apple and they covered themselves with leaves and they were apple leaves. Fig leaves means that Aphrobane is reading traditional biblical literature. She goes on to talk about the people of Coriantum and what the nature of religious belief leads them to understand. And these people represented to me an absolute idea of the first state of innocence before man knew how to sin, religion would hear but destroy that tranquility they possess by ignorance. So here they are without traditional religion, living in an innocence, uncorrupted by a sense of sin or a sense of shame. Mark Twain, if you remember, tells the story of the missionaries who first came to Hawaii and they invited everyone to church and they discovered the natives came naked 
and they were willing to listen to the minister's message, but the ministers were embarrassed to watch these natives naked, so they distributed clothes to the natives and told them to wear them next time they came back to church. And the natives did come back to church the next time. The missionaries were equally nonplussed because some of the natives wore only the shoes. Some wore only the hat. Some wore only blouses. But they were not wearing a full apparel the way the missionaries thought they would. So when we move into a concept of the state of innocence, where we understand what is meant here by religious purity. God is captain of the clouds. You limit your knowledge of the world to your natural apparition. Now, of course, the Africans are in Suriname. But in Africa, major native religions didn't have a concept of hell or heaven. They had a concept of the Ngungan. The Ngungan were the dead who lived along with the living and who advised the living in their daily lives. Wale Sayinka, the Nobel Prize winner in literature from Nigeria, has a play called The Dead where he describes the interaction of human beings in this world with those in the netherworld, those who are dead, and how closely they relate to each other as the world proceeds. Now, one of the major conflicts, religious conflicts, early in the novel occurs when Orinoco is on the ship and he is now held captive by the captain. The captain releases him of his chains and the captain promises his freedom on the ship. But Orinoco finds that the captain and he differ on religious matters. And when he complains to the captain, when Orinoco complains that he ought not be treated this way, that he ought to be treated as a prince, and that he has been improperly and wantonly detained and enslaved. The captain tells him that whatever he does on this earth, he will answer for in the other world, in heaven, after his death. And the acts he commits will be proven to be righteous. And Orinoco says to him, what kind of religion do you have? Well, you can lie to me and prove yourself untruthful. Prove yourself uh, vindictive. Prove yourself retaliatory. Prove yourself unfair. And prove yourself dishonest on this earth. And then you're going to get salvation afterwards. That's what you're looking for. He says, my people are honest up front. What we do, we answer for during our lifetime. If we are dishonest, we will suffer for it. If we are honest, honest, we will be praised for it. And he draws a very distinct difference. And You wonder what Aphrobane is saying. This woman from England, probably a, we know she was, uh, her husband had been appointed by the English, so she had to be uh, Anglican, or her husband had to be Anglican, you don't get appointments if you're not Anglican. But here she is expressing a dissenter's viewpoint and expressing a viewpoint on toleration. Now, to that extent, she is in the spirit of John Locke, who in his essay on toleration suggests ways that people can respect each other's sex. So here's a woman who is expressing a very liberal viewpoint in terms of religion. I've already mentioned to you that the Quakers wanted to bring their slaves to church and for, were forbidden to do so by law in England. In fact, throughout the novel, Aphrobane gives us a toleration of 
religion. The quote appears in the novel, Caesar would never be reconciled to our notions of the Trinity of which he ever made a jest. It was a riddle, he said, would turn his brain, would turn his brain to conceive. And one could not make him understand what faith was. So on Suriname, because he hadn't grown up in this religion, because he didn't know Christianity, because he didn't understand the idea of the Trinity, uh, the assertion was made by those who ruled him that he was ignorant and that he was non-observant. When you study this novel, remember, remember that tens of thousands of people were fleeing England and trying to get to America in order to find religious freedom and trying to prevent oppression. And here is Afrobain giving us a rather interesting acknowledgement that there are people who cannot understand the way certain sects and certain groups observe religion. The natives, Afrobain says, maintain a certain naivete in religion. Now they don't have prayer books. They're not required to read the Book of Common Prayer as the Anglicans were required. And which act the Anglicans required are the dissenters. If you did not read the Book of Common Prayer, you could not hold positions in the government. I've already mentioned that to you. Specific type of reading. By the way, there was in England an effort to change this. When James II came to the throne of England, he was Roman Catholic, he imposed what he called a law of occasional conformity. Now, what was a law of occasional conformity? James wanted priests in the colleges. He wanted Catholic priests in the government. But by law, they couldn't be there. So the law of occasional conformity said, you could go into an Anglican church Christmas or one time each year and read the Book of Common Prayer and swear allegiance to the Anglican church and then afterwards practice whatever you wanted to practice. Occasional conformity. You conformed occasionally to the Anglican church. Now, a lot of people did that. Purist Daniel Defoe, who was an absolute Presbyterian and dissenter, thought that this was hypocritical. Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels and was himself an Anglican priest, minister, also thought laws of occasional conformity were hypocritical. But people sometimes find convenient ways to practice their religion. We find that there is a prophet, a pei, who claimed, and here is the Orinoco discovering the truth about the white men who had imprisoned him. There was no faith in the white men or the gods they adored, who instructed them in principles so false that honest men could not live amongst them. Now where was Afrobane coming from? Was she one of those Puritan women writing lifetime autobiographies trying to separate herself from the established ecumenical church? Was she even a dissenter from those sects? Was she an Anglican practicing occasional conformity or observing her husband's occasional conformity if he were not an Anglican? We, we don't know those questions, but they become very important interests when you want to study what this novel is telling us. Orinoco, Afrobain says, knew what he had to do when he dealt with men of honor. 
But with them a man ought to be eternally on his guard. And never to eat and drink with Christians. And this is the African now taking a stand against hypocrisy, against being enslaved. And believe me, I'm telling you again, as I told you the other day, slavery was a real dilemma for people who followed the Bible. You were supposed to free your slaves after seven years. When you didn't, how could you justify it? Well, the English justified it economically. And they justified saving the souls of the Africans by converting them religiously. By the way, you know that great scene in the uh, Moby Dick where Ishmael is ready to go to sea on the Pequod and he's at the Spouter's Inn waiting for his roommate to show up. And in walks this giant African his body completely covered with tattoos and Ishmael shivering under the covers for fear that this harpoonist is going to harpoon him because Queequeg has this great, giant, this great harpoon in his hand. And Ishmael watches Queequeg and Queequeg goes into his duffel bag and pulls out a little idol and puts it in the middle of the floor and lights it around the fire uh, lights a fire around the idol and begins to say prayers. And Ishmael says, well, I guess it's better to sleep with a pagan who observes religious values than to sleep with a drunken Christian. And that's Melville and Moby Dick showing that the pagan is not a pagan in the sense that he is non-religious and inhuman. And so Melville and Moby Dick, Afro Bain and Orinoco, both are trying to demonstrate that the non-natives have human qualities. And that sometimes religion teaches us, in fact, the very opposite of what we should be learning. Orinoco then discovers in his slavery that he ought to be ashamed. He was ashamed of what he had done in endeavoring to make those free who were by nature slaves, poor wretched rogues, fit to be used as Christians' tools, dogs treacherous and whipped into the knowledge of Christian gods. Well, the novel is pretty hard on traditional religious belief. But you have to understand, and I'm going to tell you again, that you have the Anglican Church which represented itself as the only church in England that had rights to governance, to education, to royal prerogatives, to pensions, to honors. The cities were independent. The cities were generally filled with dissenters. Dissenters who could practice whatever religion they want because the cities had maintained and developed economic and governmental independence of the government itself. But again, we have the distinction between Anglicans and dissenters, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Quakers, the Pietists, the Congregationalists, the Baptists, the Anabaptists, all of whom were out of, had, had no rights in this religious state. Is there any wonder that the founding fathers of America, when they established the Constitution, sought the need to separate church and state? Is there any wonder that Ataturk in Turkey, at the end of World War I, sought to establish Turkey as an independent state, a part not governed by a religious statehood? 
the only state in the Middle East that does separate uh, religion and government. It's trying hard to maintain that status. The principles that we're dealing with here are principles of great concern today as they were in those periods. Now let's turn to another field, the field of economics. Okay, what are some of the economic factors? You have the slave trade in Coromantian. Enemies captured in battle or sold. So this is one way of earning your living. You have the king's marble bath. This is not a primitive society. This is a place where you have aqueducts and you have ways of replenishing the water and changing the water in marble fonts. You have a lavish carpet in the Otan. You don't have carpets of that quality if you don't make a lot of money. The king has access to oranges and citrons. Now, most people don't have access to oranges and citrons. In Europe, you had to wait until summer came, or you had to wait until shipments from other countries. Certainly in winter time, very few people had these fruits. except the king. You know, we're all spoiled living in Texas. We get oranges all year round. We get grapefruits all year round. We get watermelon all year round at the most inexpensive prices. I was in Boston last winter, and they were selling watermelon at 69 cents a pound. So if you bought a water watermelon, you were paying 13 to 15 dollars for it because they don't have access to the valley and the markets we have. You think nothing of going into a store and buying a bag of oranges for a couple of dollars, or going into our cafeteria and buying an orange for 80 cents. You don't think that it's winter, it's January or February and March, and here you have access easily to fruits that are forbidden in many parts of the world at this season. But for a king to have citron, for a king to have oranges, means he had wealth. The arrival of ships at port. So there's a thriving economic trade. You can go down to the port of Houston, and you can ask for their statistics on every shipment to every country in the world out of this port. You would be amazed at the millions and millions of dollars and the millions of pounds of goods that leave this port and enter this port. You're a major, Houston is a major port city. And Coromantium apparently was a major port city in the area of Ghana. What do they trade? In addition to slaves, you have balm and gum from trees. You have aromatic balm for candles. Even gold could be dug out of Coromantian's uh, earth resources. It became a loss of the country's resources, but it became wealth for the world. The slaves leaving um, Suriname also give us a sense of economics. Can you think of any other aspects of this novel that deal with economics? How do you support slaves on an island? How do you feed them? They have to grow their own crops. And we've spoken about how rich this market is. All right, let's look at another area. Let's look at art and aesthetics. Well. Go to the first part of your novel. 
where Aphrobain tells us what she brought from the New World, from Suriname, and gave to people in England. It's on page 422 of your text at the very beginning of the novel. She brought baskets, weapons, and aprons. We dealt with them beads of all colors, knives, axes, pins, and needles, which they use as tools to drill holes with their ears, uh, to, deal, to drill holes with, in their ears, noses, and lips, where they hang a great many little things. As long beads, bits of tin, brass of s or silver, beat thin, I'm sorry, they hang a great many little things, such as long beads, bits of tin, brass or silver, beat thin, and any shining trinket. The beads they weave into aprons about a quarter of an hour long, and the same breath, working them very prettily and with flowers of several colors of beads. Aprons they wear with them. The men wear long stripes of linen. They wear shoulder belts. They adorn themselves with a long black hair, face painted with specks of flowers. Some of the women um, have very special types of beauty and wear various types of makeup. So with art and aesthetics, we have a very rich description of the jewels they wear. By the way, nose rings, ear rings, eye rings are nothing new. If you remember in the Hebrew scriptures, the uh, Hebrews are told in order to build Solomon's temple, they should bring gold and they should bring their nose rings and their earrings. So such things are not even new today. They're traditional in societies where people want to decorate themselves. We also have the aesthetics of the appearance of Imawenda and the appearance of uh, Orinoco. What do they look like? They're more Greek in appearance. Turn to page 425 in your text. This becomes the aesthetic attitude. Now it's not surprising that they look more Greek in appearance uh, because the Romans did invade Africa. You have the uh, interaction of Roman and African uh, peoples. But let's look at this aesthetic description. This great and just character of Orinoco gave me an extreme curiosity to see him, especially when I knew he spoke French and English and that I could talk with him. This is not an uneducated fellow. He came into the room and addressed himself to me and some other women with the best grace in the world. He was pretty tall, but of a shape the most exact that can be fancied. The most famous statuary could not form the figure of a man more admirably turned from head to foot. Think of the statue of David. Think of the statues that you find in the museums of the world, and there you have Orinoco. His face was not of that brown, rusty black, which most of that nation are, but a perfect ebony or polished jet. There's an interesting distinction. Aphrobane is saying there are different colors of black. There's tawny. There is ebony. This man is rich ebony in his color, not brown or rusty black. You know, when we pick up application forms, we see to the extent to which human beings are denied their identity. When you see that you've got to identify whether you're white, black, brown or other. Well, if you're white, your skin may be white, reddish, tawny, blanched, reddish. If you're black, you may be brown, ochre, more orange, more chocolate, more ebony. So to call people black or white is again an absolute uh, denial of one's own appearance and one's own identity. We don't realize how much words can deny us our, our, our beingness, our being individual. 
but such words do. And Aphrobane is not, is recognizing these distinctions as being of some quality. His eyes were the most awful that could be seen and very piercing. Now awful doesn't mean what you think that they're running and they have cataracts. Awful means they are awesome. They inspire awe. You look at their eyes and you go and elect them President of the United States because they have these trusting eyes and this, this appearance, this capability to look at us. The white of them, uh, his eyes were the most awful that could be seen and very piercing. The white of them being like snow as were his teeth. His nose was rising and Roman instead of African and flat. His mouth, the finest shape that could be seen, far from those great turned lips which are so natural to the rest of the Negroes. And she's referring to the Gullah, those speaking the Gullah dialect uh, in a special way. The whole proportion and air of his face was so noble and exactly formed that bathing his color there could be nothing in nature more beautiful, agreeable, and handsome. There was no one grace wanting that bears the standard of true beauty. His hair came down to his shoulders by the aids of art. By the aids of art. That means people had worked on his hair. This is artifice. Anything artifice is art. And this was done by pulling it out with a quill and keeping it combed, of which he took particular care. By the way, Barbershop 2 is a movie you might want to see, along with Barbershop 1, to see these events being explicated. Nor did the perfections of his mind come short of those of his person, for his discourse was admirable upon any subject. He was a man with enough education that he could speak about any subject. He could speak about the cosmos, he could speak about the land, he could speak about war. He was the Renaissance man, as Milton says. Everyone must serve in public and private service, in peace and in war. And here was Orinoco, capable of doing it. But where was he? With all these, this glory, he is a slave. And of course, we have him described as uh, the, we go to the general who had been killed. The general had a daughter, and let's see what she looks like. She was female to the noble male, the beautiful black Venus to our young Mars, as charming in her person as he, and of delicate virtues. I have seen a hundred white men sighing after her and making a thousand vowels at her feet, all vain and unsuccessful. And she was indeed too great for any but a prince of her own nation to endure, adore, and that's Imoenda. Well, the art and aesthetics, the beautiful Persian carpet in the Otan, the appearance of Orinoco, the appearance of Imoenda, the ability of Orinoco to speak and to use words and to articulate all become part of our understanding of art and aesthetics. And of course, the fact that this is a novel written by Aphrobane itself is a work of art. And you have to understand all the information, all the detail that she brings into this novel to give it life, to animate African experience for us. It's rather unique. Let's look at science and technology for a few moments. By the way, any ideas you have to enhance this description, feel free to do so. Because what you have is a novel so replete with detail that it's a, it's a great accomplishment. All right, first of all, we have the palace bath. How do you bring water into a palace bath? How do you move water out? The first indoor bathroom did a, wasn't installed in England until 1790. Most people in England didn't take baths but once a year. 
You say, that's horrible. Well, they may have gone down to a stream, may have doused themselves with water. But most of the men and many of the, most of the women wore wigs in the 18th century because this was a, a way of warding off lice. If you had hair, the lice could get in your hair and you had to pick them out. Perfumes were in abundance, balm, but no running water, no flush bath, bathrooms, no, a, no showers. We find out that Orinoco had military, military training in mathematics, fortifications, and hunting. In fact, the king tells Imuenda that he's really not interested in you. He's much more interested in his ROTC training. If Orinoco were at the University of Houston, he would join either the military ROTC or the Air Force ROTC and have the ability to learn about fortifications and how to maintain the hunt. And again, as I say, it's worthy. Milton says you must prepare yourself for public and private service in, you must prepare yourself for public and private duty in peace and in war. So people who are engaged in those interests are moving toward the Renaissance understanding of civil obligation. We find out that there are globes and maps of the slave ship. To entice Orinoco to examine these, and once on the ship, of course, he is imprisoned. There are tiger hunts, and you have to learn how to hunt tigers a specific way in Coromantium. The art of fishing becomes of some interest, and a... Uh, Again, this is scientific and technical. How do you throw out a rod? How do you spear the fish? How do you fry it? Then you learn about the medical practice of the spiritual prophet, the Pei. The Pei is the prophet, and he's a medicine man. Well, that's not new. <clears throat> we have in our library a four or five hundred page edition of all the medieval surgeons, physicians, and barbers that existed in, I think, the fourth, 12th to the 14th century. I may not have that exactly right, but it wasn't unusual for surgeons uh, and barbers to practice medicine. It certainly wasn't unusual for clergymen to offer herbs and to offer various solutions to medicinal problems, to deliver children. Uh, you go to your priest in order to get to, to, to find ways to heal yourself. And uh, in Africa, the roots and the herbs in the forests provide the natural substances by which people may gain cures. Several years ago, the United States gov government sent 2,000 biologists to the rainforests of the world, which are being slowly depleted. And their job was to find every herb and every root that natives were using to cure illnesses uh, in those countries. What, of course, happens is the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies take these herbs, take these roots, and they identify the chemical composition and then create artificial and synthetic drugs that replicate them. Yes. We have a speaker. I read an article in, uh, I forgot, was it Scientific American or somewhere a few years ago, that the... Um, the experts in those countries uh, had been abandoning their knowledge in favor of trying to become um, Western type doctors. And so they, it, there's an urgency about finding it out before the uh, wisdom is lost. Yes, yes. I think the urgency was understood when the government spent that money to send the biologists around the world. But we have <coughs> various types of operations occurring. There are a uh, what is the technique by which one 
remedies, physical illnesses by sticking you with pins. What is it called? Acupuncture. Acupuncture. Uh, several years ago, I think every member of our track team was visiting acupuncture artists in Houston to help remedy some of the ills they had. And this was being sanctioned. This was a, uh, a very good practice. And apparently, they were, they were gaining relief through acupuncture. Uh, we find that there are bows and arrows with poison arrows. You've got to know what kind of poison to use in order to render the animal you are shooting uh, defenseless. And then we find that Orinoco is in fetters. He's in chains. Well, that's an element of technology as well. Now, if you want to see what, if you want to know what slave chains look like, you don't have to go far. You can walk from here to the Church of the Madonna on Martin Luther King Boulevard. It's only about a five-minute walk. And go to the slave museum they have there. They have, behind the church is a slave, is, a, is an African bookstore that sells books about African literature and African life, plus statuary and sculpture from Africa. And then behind that is a slave museum. You can see the bales of cotton on display. You can see the chains on display. They even have a model of a hanging, a lynching on display. So within the five minutes walk of this campus, of where you are right now, you can see the fetters and the hardware used in the slave trade uh, in America. And it's worth seeing if you haven't done that before. Uh, then you have some surgery performed where Orinoco has disemboweled himself and a surgeon attempts to repair Orinoco's uh, self-inflicted disembowelment. Now, this of course is all part of the science and technology which uh, Afrobain discusses in, in Orinoco. I think that the opportunities for understanding the complexity of society find multiple opportunities in this novel. What you want to do when you write about this novel is focus on one of these issues and then explore it to its depths. And then what you want to do when you write a paper is go to some databases on slavery. Go to some da databases on the technology of slave implements. Go to books that deal with the nature of poisons used on the ends of arrows by huntsmen. Build up your knowledge, your database, and add to the technology that this novel ultimately gives us. Let's move to the subject of education. What kinds of education does Orinoco get in the novel? Well, he's trained as a warrior. His tutor, who is French, perceives him ready apt, and with a quick apprehension and taught him morals, language, and science. He had heard of and admired the Romans. He had heard of the late civil wars in England, and he knew of the de deplorable death of our late monarch. So y when you hear that, Aphrobane is taking a royalist position and a, uh, working to working her complaint against the execution of Charles I. But here we have a Renaissance education that Orinoco is getting. This is the reason you study the classics at this university, why you should study foreign languages, why you're asked to study math and other sciences. You want to be as well educated as Orinoco before you leave, leave this institution. You also want to get into intramural sports so that you can throw a spear or you can chase down someone else and you don't want to kill them, but you can <laughs> just about tackle them with as much ferocity as possible. Treffery was a very good mathematician and a linguist and could speak uh, French and Spanish. 
Orinoco is named Caesar, and of course I've told you about the irony we're there. And then there's an allusion to Hannibal, who had to cross the, uh, uh, the mountains in order to achieve victory over the Romans. So that your education becomes re relatively important. And Orinoco, in order to become a prince, and in order to succeed to the throne of Coromantian, must be educated. You don't have ignorant people rising to the top. The more you know, the better off you are. I think uh, let's now move to the last category, which is the conduct of human behavior. How does society conduct itself? Well, the king has many wives and many concubines. It's a polygamous society, just as King David's society was polygamous. I've already mentioned this with Absalom and Achitophel. And there, there's no problem, but the king may have whomever he desires. This is an expression of his king. For Emoenda, the king saw and burned. So he is lustful, he is passionate, this woman will be his. We find in social behavior, Aphrobane is kind of amazed with this. She says, a Negro can change color, for I've seen him as frequently blush and look pale as visibly as ever I saw in the most beautiful white. Now that may seem to be an odd statement to make, but here's Aphrobane humanizing, associating, drawing comparisons between her society and what is a foreign alien society that people don't understand. Now we move into the love affair. Orinoco wants Imuenda. She is in the Otan and he can't get to her, but Aboam his friend will sacrifice himself to get Orinoco into the Otan. What does he do? He meets Onachal, an older woman, who will admit him to the Otan only if Aboan makes love to her. She's lonesome too. I mean, the king can, if he has 300 wives, he can only see so many a, a day. Uh, and so uh, Aboan sacrifices himself to Onachal so that Orinoco can be admitted to the Otan, and Orinoco consummates his love with Imoenda there. We find in social love that even that in Suriname, the slaves have feasts, and they can celebrate events as well. One of the problems in uh, Suriname is the fact that Orinoco leads a sedentary life. I've already mentioned to you the degree to which this lifestyle is debilitating for him. And consequently, he is invited to lead hunts. And uh, his ability to lead the hunt not only gives the Englishmen their sport and their sport with Orinoco, but it gives him a way to expel the energy that he would have spelled, expelled were he hunting in his native country. We find that Captain Treffrey is in love, has a love for Clement, who is Imoenda, and how she is modest and how she rejects his advances. We're also treated in this novel to Aphrobane's description of Orinoco's life amongst the Indians. These are people who are defeated by the Dutch, people who are native to Suriname, and who are of a different culture than the Africans who have come to Suriname, and of the uh, whites who have sustained and maintained control of Suriname. 
we find that there is a feast, an elaborate feast is maintained, including buffalo and venison, with a tablecloth made of a sarambo leaf. That is, the people, even in slavery, are able to maintain a lifestyle and a dignity, a home convenience and a home uh, atmosphere that allows them to exist in these circumstances. I think that we've covered a lot of ground today, and I'm sure that you will have even more to add about Orinoco when you provide insight into this text as you begin to write and discuss it further. Thank you very much.